Rattle just handles all the doctor in theoretical mathematics from MIT and associateship from the Society of Actuaries and is in the doctoral program at the Spartus Institute for a degree in Jewish studies. He's currently an adjunct to faculty member at Towson University, which has recently become a center of actuarial excellence. His research and publication interests include discrete number theory, actuarial science, biblical exegesis, the theory of pedagogy, applications of technology to pedagogy and the interaction of mathematics and the arts. He regularly reviews books for the Mathematical Association of America. Okay. Okay, I guess we should begin. Ah, the, the people I was waiting for just came. Good. Okay, so, um, and one other thing. Uh, we have, we have, one second, we have, everyone's getting about a half hour. Okay. Yep. Okay, so we're five minutes off. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm coming after lunch, so I guess uh, you're in a good mood. I'm going to speak about a cybernetic interdisciplinary approach to pedagogic challenge. That's who I am, and this is the Easter conference. And um, okay, so I'm going to give you an over uh, sort of a overview of what I'm trying to do. There are three ways to look at it. One way is you can say I'm doing a revolution. Everyone's comfortable. There are 50 years of theories on what pedagogic challenge is. Uh, that we'll review that. It includes people like uh, Bloom and Anderson and everyone else. And I'm saying we should think about it in a different way. Uh, a second uh, point of my presentation is the spirit of Ashby. Ashby was a cybernetician, and uh, he proposed or he emphasized looking at things operationally instead of using a lot of jargon. If you go to the pedagogic literature, so you'll or you hear just hear people here speak today, they speak about higher order critical thinking skills. Well, what does higher order mean? They'll speak about challenging students. What does that mean? They'll, think, uh, they'll speak about making them think. What does that mean? So I'm going to tell you what it means in a very simple way that anyone can identify yes or no. So I'm throwing out some of the jargon. Even if I'm not creating a revolution, I'm showing you how to think about this more concretely. Uh, a third thing is I'm unifying. So forget about the revolution. Let's say I'm not creating a revolution. I'm not telling you to avoid anything that's been done. For example, uh, there are about 38 states that have accepted the new core standards. Uh, the core standards are ways that people should teach in high school and elementary school. One of the core standards is if you're teaching math, you should have a lot of verbal problems. You shouldn't just teach them formulas. You should teach them how to take a verbal problem and, mod and model it. Well, I'm still going to tell you to do that. That is pedagogically challenged. What I'm going to do is tell you why it's pedagogically challenged. I'm not going to just accept the fact that it is. I'm going to show you, I'm going to identify for you why it's uh, challenging. And the, the fourth aspect, I'm sorry, I didn't underline that, it's brain function. I I'm going to relate pedagogy and improving thinking to uh, functions of the brain that we now know a great deal about. OK, so here's an outline. I'm going to review 50 years of theories. After all, I'm, I'm, whether I'm supplementing them or replacing them, I'm still going to review them. I'm going to review briefly cybernetics because I think it's important to understand that what I'm doing has nothing to do with the content of a discipline. It's interdisciplinary. It depends totally on the information flow within the discipline. And as I said, it's very operational. Anyone, when they finish this lecture, can go to a, a textbook and say, this is higher order, this is not higher order. Very simple test. Um, I'm going to go through executive function because I define higher order thinking if it involves executive function. We don't exactly know what executive function is, but, but it is well understood. Uh, my new proposed definition, so this will be a theme throughout what I'm going to do throughout the presentation. I'm going to tell you the punchline now is give examples of it. Something's pedagogically challenging if it involves multiple brain areas. If you're in one area of the brain, it's not pedagogically challenged. It may be difficult, but it's not pedagogically challenged. Also, I want everything done multi-parameters. 
You don't say if A, B. You say if A, B, and C, then D. And if A, not B, C, then E. You have multiple parameters to consider. When you have those two ingredients, lots of parameters, multiple brain areas, um, you have pedagogic challenge. Um, I'm going to focus today on visual and other pedagogic areas, but I'll show how ge use of geometry can help in mathematics, in writing, in law, in music, and in literature. So those are five disciplines. One doesn't think of law as involving geometry. One doesn't think of writing as involving geometry. Uh, the same thing for music and literature, but I'll show how using that can enrich a curriculum. OK. I want to go through 50 years of pedagogic hierarchies. Some of you may know this. Some of you may not know this. So I'll just review the history. A person named Benjamin Bloom uh, in the late 50s uh, thought it'd be nice if they gathered what they knew at the time. This is the late 50s about pedagogy. And he created a hierarchy called Bloom's Hierarchy. We'll get into it in a second. And that just went off like fire. If you wanted to teach, you had to follow Bloom's Hierarchy. Since then, some people have criticized or modified Bloom's hierarchy, and there are some very important people here, Anderson, Von Heile, Gagne, Marzano, Webb, Piaget, Bruner, and the comma there, of course, there are a lot of others. Um, I call that the first generation. That's my own terminology. There's a second generation of thinkers, and they started looking at things. Yazdani, for example, Yazdani looked at Von Heile and Gagne, and he said, well, I've looked at schools that use von Heile. I've used, looked at schools that use Gagne, and the results are the same. They both improve teaching of geometry. So they're saying they may have been different people in different formulations, but they're getting the same results. And then there's Pegg and Hess. Uh, uh, Hess looked at uh, Webb and I think Marzano. But the point is, each of these people looked at disparate theories and said they're doing the same thing. Lots and hots, that's lower order thinking skills and higher order thinking skills, and that's something that pervades the literature. So there's a whole, uh, there's a whole culture of language and everything else, and we'll get into it. Now I'm just going to go through this quickly because this is not the subject of my presentation. These are the six Bloom categories, knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation. So the lowest level is knowledge. Let me just give you a flavor of this if you've never seen it. Knowledge means you learn a bunch of facts. Well, that's not, that's lots. That's lower order thinking skills. Comprehension is, well, I just memorize things. If you ask me a question, I can give it back. That's also rather lower order thinking. Application is, besides memorizing things, if you give me a situation and I say, oh, that's the principle I learned, I can apply it. Also lower order thinking. Then there's analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. Analysis means I can break things down and say this has this and this has that. That is something cr creative. Synthesis means I can take for, uh, a project, I can look at four or five things and bring them together. And evaluation is similarly a higher order thinking. Anderson came along, Anderson was a student of Bloom. He replaced the, the nouns by verbs. Uh, knowledge corresponds to remember, comprehension to understand, application corresponds to apply. It's interesting that Anderson reversed the order here. Instead of synthesis evaluation, they have evaluate create. And part of my theme is there's no right or wrong here. I'm replacing it by something concrete, which is right. Von Heile worked in geometry. He did tremendously good things. He said, every person who learns geometry goes through five stages, recognition, analysis, order, deduction, and rigor. He introduced a lot in our understanding of geometry, for example. He said each stage has its distinct language and characteristics. If you ask a sta person in stage one recognition why something's a triangle, they'll say, well, it looks like a triangle. Uh, that yield sign's a triangle, and it just looks just like it. They, they lack the vocabulary to analyze it and say it's a triangle because it has three sides. That's a second stage. And, and very often, a frustration of a teacher in teaching is because they don't understand this person's at a different level. And uh, this was a husband-wife team. Gagne said, he said lots of things, but he had nine stages you have to go through. Attention, objective, short-term memory, information, presentation, performance, guidance, feedback, assessment, and transfer. And as I said, yes, that, these do not look the same. Because Danny came along and said, I've looked at schools that use this and schools that use that. The results are the same. You improve retention. So 
there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here, and I could certainly spend the whole day on it. How do they people use the hierarchies? First of all, you have to know collections of synonyms. I say, what is create? Um, uh, so I give some examples here. Marzano was a later theory. He had four stages, retrieval, comprehension, analysis, knowledge, utilization. So you'll say, what does analysis mean? Well, he gives synonyms here. You can analyze something by matching two, two things. You can analyze something by cutting up a pie and classifying it. You can do an error analysis. You can analyze something by generalizing it, by specifying it. And, and anyone who goes through these things, and you can find them all over the internet, for every word, they're like five or six or seven synonyms. And they say, you can recognize this by applying one of these synonyms. So I call it synonym analysis. It's a bit derogatory. That's the way I look at it. But that's the way it is. Other aspects of the hierarchy, I, I mention certain things about von Heile, fixed sequence, adjacency, distinction, separation, and attainment. Um, separation, as I already told you, means if you're talking to someone at level one and say, why is something a triangle? You can argue with them all day and say, that's circular. They say, no, it's not circular. It's a triangle because it looks like the yield sign. The yield sign is triangle. They say, how do you know? Well, you can see they're the same. And you can talk to them, and you get frustrated. You don't understand that's the level they're at. And by, like, von Heile says everyone goes through these levels. And he, he, they, they were a husband and wife team. He did the theory. She did the application. They did improve it. I don't know why more people don't use it, but it's a, an important theory. OK, I've, I've already mentioned Yazdani, Shogag, Gagne, and von Heile are the same. Uh, Hess did a matrix, Webb versus Bloom Anderson. So Webb had four levels of higher order thinking. Bloom Anderson had six levels. So you make four levels here, six levels here. And then what Hess did is they gathered homework assignments, I think about 20,000 homework assignments in the New York area. What are people in elementary school giving for homework assignments? They took each homework assignment, says, where does this homework assignment belong on this matrix? Not surprisingly, things are still lower order, even though we know this. So the advantage is we can now say it's lower order. But they, there's a lot of work being done now, and we have the vocabulary and tools. Uh, and Pegg uh, looked at the solo cycle, Br Brunner, Von Heile, Piaget, and all these go from the sensory to the abstract. Piaget, you may be familiar with. As I said, I don't have time to go through all these things. I wanted to go through what I was uh, doing today. OK, that's stage one. I've told you about the hierarchies. If you want to do pedagogic, you find some person, you find their hierarchies, you learn the synonyms, and you apply them. Now. Let me just tell you about cybernetics. That's the URL for the website. Cybernetics is organization of the whole. It's communication between parts of a complex system independent of content. The last three words are the most important. In other words, you're looking at how information flows within a system, within a discipline, within anything. Uh, there are chairs over there if people want. And uh, when you do that, and it has nothing to do with content, just with the flow between parts, it's cybernetics. It's one aspect of cybernetics. Uh, I was speaking to Stuart at, at lunch. Each conflict field, ideally, is supposed to have a cybernetician. So anthropology has a cybernetician. Psychology has one. Computer science has one. Economics has one. And Stuart was telling me the world isn't always ideal. But the point is, uh, the point is each person took the principles of information flow and applied it to their discipline. And that gives a greater understanding. Ashby was in psychology, and he emphasized that when we're talking about the brain, we should deal with mechanistic terms and operational throughout the higher order jargon of higher order thinking, challenging. And uh, you know, people use it because they're supposed to use it, but what does it mean? What, is it, what, can, what can you point to and say that's higher order? So that's one of the things I'm trying to do today. And what I'm going to say is, um, yeah, um, pedagogy is the content-independent information flow within a system of knowledge that maximizes the learning experience. And what I wanted to add, I'm going to introduce executive function now. It does it by using multiple areas of the brain and uh, multi-parameters. So I'll just go through that, and then I'll give the examples. Executive function, it's normally connected with the frontal lobes here. We know that people who've been in accidents that have damaged the frontal lobes have lost something. They haven't lost their ability to do well on a lot of performance tests. They've lost their ability to integrate multiple tasks. Um, there are several types of executive functions. They're performance-based and rating-based. 
Uh, it's often seen with frontal lobe damage, though we don't believe the frontal lobes are responsible for them. Uh, we're looking at one type of performance-based test, and that's one that deals with multiple parameters, which is what I'm trying to push today. So let me give you three tests. I'll start with the trail-making tests. Trail-making tests, you can look any of these up on, on, on the net. The, the test A gives you a piece of paper with 25 circles. And your task is to make a trail. That's why it's called the trail-making test. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and finish at 25. Test B is a paper with 25 circles, and you're supposed to make a trail, 1A, 2B, 3C. Now, those two tasks look the same, but the remarkable thing is test B always takes longer. And this test is used diagnostically. If, if you've had a stroke, I can tell how much damage uh, happens through this. Uh, I can tell whether you'll recover from a stroke by the difference between these two and other things. Those who are curious can take the test on, you can download it and take the test, and you'll see test B takes longer than test A. The reason test B takes longer is because you're using two parts of the brain. The numbers are in one part of the brain, the alphabet's in the other part of the brain, and therefore it takes longer. That's executive function. Um, this is the Wisconsin card sorting test. It doesn't actually look like this, but I made a version for PowerPoint. So, um, I have A, B, B, and C, C, C. And the point is, what is, so every card is flashed, and you're supposed to say what DD resembles. Does it resemble uh, C, C, C because it's italics? Does it resemble B, B because of the dimension of number? Does it resemble A because of the dimension of lower case? Now, there's no right answer, but the point is, you go through this, you finally find out what's right. You keep on guessing. Let's say you found out number was right. So every time a card is flashed, you guess by number. Then the, the tester changes the criteria. Maybe now it'll be letter. And you get a little bit frustrated, and then you go through it again. And there's a whole sequence like this. And again, what they're measuring is your capacity to deal with multiple parameters. They're also dealing with your capacity to change. I've had, a, I've had an assumption about the real world. Isn't this what we want to do in teaching? And we say, well, I've just changed the assumption. Can you change? And you can't argue with the person and say, no, it's supposed to be numbered. He changed it, so can you change? Uh, the other thing is the Stroop interference test. Again, I've modified this for this conference. It's supposed to be based on color. Um, I can go through these things say apple is small, font ball is big, doll is small, ear is small, foot is big. Now, if I go through the second row, small is big font, big is small font, ant and fly are big font, an elephant is small font. The point is, when you go through the second row, people take longer. That's called Stroop interference. And the reason is, you're not just looking at one dimension font size, you're looking at two dimensions meaning. So, um, these three tests, you're predicting a Boolean parameter in terms of independent variables. So, in the Stroop test, size is a function of meaning and letter form. You have to suppress meaning, but it's still a Boolean function. The Wisconsin card sorting test similarity is a function of number, size, and style. The actual Wisconsin card sorting test uses shapes and, um, and colors, and you can download these and take them yourself. In the trail making test, the next item is a function of no number, letter, and the current, the current uh, position. And as I said, the more parameters you have, you're using executive function, and that's my criteria for um, pedagogically challenging. And as I say, these tests look simple. People are surprised that the trail-making test at test B takes longer than test A. Why can't I do 1A, 2B, 3C as fast as I can do 1, 2, 3, 25? The answer is you can't because you're using a different part of the brain. And the surprising thing is this test is used clinically. I myself didn't believe it, so I went to someone I know. He's a neuropsychiatrist. I said, do you use this? And he says, yes. I said, you use it? He said, yeah, I just used it yesterday. The point is you use it. Anytime a person's in an auto accident, you want to see if there's been brain damage. A person has a stroke, you use it. I mean, there are a sequence of tests, but the point is it's used. OK. So here's my proposed new definition of pedagogic challenge and hierarchy. A discipline is taught, mastered in a pedagogically challenging manner if the discipline simultaneously addresses multiple areas of the brain and mind, emphasis on the word mul multiple, the problems of the, the, of the discipline are formulated using multidimensional parameters. So the problems have the Boolean function involved has many parameters, and there are multiple areas. Now, I was speaking to some people yesterday. Uh, there's nothing prohibiting this from being done by an interdisciplinary team. 
My point of view right now is I'm defining pedagogic challenge. You can go to any textbook, any place, and simply ask how many areas of the brain are involved, how many parameters are involved, and say yes or no, this is pedagogically challenged. So that's my definition. And in the rest of the lecture, I will go through examples. Some of them are well known. The properties of the definition, it's cybernetic. It's discipline independent. I haven't mentioned anything about the content of the discipline. I've asked you how many areas of the brain are involved. I've asked you what the Boolean function looks like. Nothing to do with content. It's operational. I'm not using jargon like higher order critical thinking skills or challenging or analysis or creation, creation or evaluation. I'm saying how many brain areas and multiple parameters are being used. I'm counting things. So if I go to two textbooks and one asks questions that have four or five parameters and one asks questions with two or three, I'll know the second book is more important. OK. So let me give some examples. Some of these are known. Uh, on the left side here, I have the verbal part of the brain. On the right side here, I have the algebraic part of the brain. This is from high school algebra. Some, some places in the country still teach this. I mean, uh, I, I used to teach this when my students did poorly. I said, why don't you know it? And they said, you don't always have to take it. Anyway, Amy purchases for a friend's four peanut bags. So that's 4P algebraically. And the word N corresponds to the plus. And again, N is English, plus is mathematical. One quart of orange juice, one Q. I could say one OJ. For a price, for a price is the equal sign of six. So I've translated this English sentence into algebra. And had Amy purchased one peanut bag, that's one P, and four quarts plus four Q, it would have priced to nine. How much does a peanut bag and orange juice quart cost? And that corresponds to solve for P and Q. I've shown you that this is pedagogically challenged. I haven't told you how to solve the two equations. I don't really care. I mean, I could throw this out and ask students to solve it, solve it in a team, solve it with a computer. The point here is the reason this is pedagogically challenged is I'm jumping forth between language and algebra. I've actually done problems like this at a, at a college level, and I'll ask students to translate things, and they'll translate the English into English, and I'll say, no, translate into algebra. It, it's difficult at first. You have to get used to it, and, that's, um, and that is uh, executive function. This is from the core, sorry, sorry, I keep on getting away. This is from the core standards, which is a collection of things that have, a collection of approaches to teaching math and English and other things which have been adopted by three dozen, four dozen states. The point is they're trying to make the curriculum uniform. Uh, so they consider verbal problems challenging. I'm simply explaining why, because it involves executive function. Uh, and then I tried to say, what can I do here? I have about five minutes left. So I'm going to look at geometry and math, geometry and writing, geometry and law, geometry and literature, and music. So this will be very quick, but I just want to show you how some people are doing this in respective fields. Uh, these are just two dimensions of the brain, but it's worthwhile seeing how this can be done. Um, so I took the following thing. Now, Rene Descartes in the 16th century or 15th century made algebraic geometry. It's hard to think what things were like before then, but I've read about them. If you ask a Greek to solve a quadratic equation, he would not use the quadratic formula he would draw some pictures. And you can actually find constructions for that. If, if you asked a Babylonian to, uh, to uh, trice, bisect an angle, they wouldn't draw anything. They would do things algebraically. There were two schools of thought. Each one did things their way, and no one thought of, of bringing it together into disciplinary. It wasn't that they were hostile. They just didn't. That's the way each one thought. And Rene Descartes, who was a brilliant philosopher, but also a brilliant mathematician, said, we can get a lot more done if we do things this way. And I'll just show you y equals x. So when x is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, y is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. y is 6 minus x. Well, when x is 0, y is 6. 6 minus 0, and x is 1, 1 is 5. When x is 3, y is 3. So here I'm using a table approach, and I could discover that 3 is the solution to y equals x and y equals 6 minus x. x is, x is 3 and y is 3. You can see, indeed, 3 is 3 and 3 is 6 minus 3. I didn't solve it. I did it experimentally. Now, I wouldn't say there's no flavor there. I'd say I used one area of the brain. Um, yeah, I didn't draw the, the line here, but for those who know, this is the graph 
of y equals x. And this is the graph of 6 minus x. And they meet over here. And, if I, and what they do in algebraic geometry is says a pair of numbers corresponds to a point, and a line corresponds to a collection of points. And solving two equations, the intersection of the two lines. That was Rene Descartes' contribution to, uh, to mathematics. And it totally changed the way mathematics was done. It's, a, it's the first major example of global interdisciplinary um, mathematics. Rule of three, now the rule of four from Deborah U. Halle. And I'll speak about this in my local lecture today. Basically, we had a crisis. We still have a crisis in calculus. And the famous conference in Tulane, not too far from here in the 86, people got up. It was very interesting, because professors never admit they do anything wrong. They said, if the failure rate for calculus is 50%, it's not their fault, it's our fault. We're teaching it incorrectly. So from that time on, everyone said, this is the way you should teach calculus. Uh, Deborah is at Harvard, and she came up with the rule of three or, um, four. It was the rule of three in the old days. She said, teach calculus by doing every problem. Make sure there's a verbal component, an algebraic component, um, uh, a, a computational component, and a geometric component. And she is using that, and she's been very successful. OK. Writing in geometry. Um, I didn't want to draw trees here. OK, there's a paper by Nair about 15 authors in a Asian social science. And this is the idea they have. I'm going through this quickly because the lecture is coming to an end. But draw an outline of the essay as a graph of tree-like nodes with various connections. So uh, maybe I want to say why this is such a nice day. So I say the weather's nice. And then I say, no, it's nice because I'm meeting all these nice people. It's nice because I'm talking today. It's nice because I had a nice lunch. So each of these things is a node on the graph. And I start connecting things. What should I put in the same paragraph? And that's what Nair said. He, he gave a geometric component to writing. And it's interesting. Uh, I just brought this in because besides the intellectual affect that it improves writing, they explain it emotionally. They say the graph strategy is a strategy. Once the students master it, there's removal of anxiety. And there are tests by which you can say they removed anxiety. Once they remove the anxiety, they feel self-efficacy. That's Bandura. They feel, I can write. Once you feel you can write, you write more. If someone writes to you, don't, you're not afraid to write an email because you know how to write. And once you write a lot, you have improved writing. Um, I was going to give this, but um, if you look at Genesis 1, it follows this pattern. There are six days of creation. Each day has a theme, and each theme has sub-themes. So you can imagine God writing a, like a little tree of ideas and then writing the chapter from that. I try to do it in a small amount of a space. That's why I picked that example. OK. Uh, Tzvi Kanarek is an Israeli-based researcher. Uh, he bases himself on what he calls SVT, self-study, visual, and technology. Visual and technology is the rule of two. He is busy. In Israel, there's a, uh, there's a requirement to teach Talmud in high school. Talmud is Jewish law. It's very, very complicated, like any legal system. And um, he also he reports increased emotional satisfaction. Um, he uses certain structures, geometric structures. So here's an example. This is taken from a technical uh, tractate dealing with lost articles. So the first paragraph says, these are the lost articles belonging to you. If you find them, these are the lost articles you have to return. And he, he puts them in a two-column list. Scattered fruit you can keep. But fruit in a vessel, well, there's a way to recognize it. Maybe the owner can come back and say, I lost a vessel. It had this engraving, and it belongs to me. If you find scattered money, keep it. If you find a wallet, you can't keep it. It has identification. The wallet has characteristics. Uh, small sheaf bundles in the public you can keep. But arranged heaps of fruit and money you can't keep, colored wool, you can keep various types of things. So the point is, he uses this, and he's gone to ninth graders and tenth graders. And, and you can see, the interesting thing is, it's not that they've improved in their Talmud tests. They feel better about it. Um, parallelism. When people read the Bible, they usually don't draw pictures. So this is something uh, very simple. This is a verse from Genesis. It's about. Uh, Patriarch Jacob is blessing Judah. He says, in his days, when the king will come, uh, they will wash in wine their garments and wash in the blood of grapes their sauce. 
that's a Hebrew word. No one knows what the word sus means. It doesn't occur anyplace else in the Bible. But if you line things up this way, wine corresponds to blood of grapes. Well, picturesque, but I can understand that. Blood of grapes, you kill the grapes, blood comes out. Then garments must correspond to sus. So the comment everyone makes based on the parallelism is that sus is a type of garment. Here I've used geometry to enhance my, name, my conception of, uh, of literature. Um, oh, I have time for the last one. I just have about two minutes left. Uh, this is a verse from the Decalogue. Don't swear in my, uh, uh, do not, do not bear the name of God for naught. There's another verse in Leviticus. Do not swear in my name falsely. I'll just mention the use of for naught and falsely. So the Talmud says there are two ways to take a false oath. I can swear that that this pen is a pencil, uh, that this pencil is a pretzel. And I could swear this pencil is a pencil. One is falsely and one's for naught. But again, I'm using geometry to enhance that. Kugel has done a lot of good work using geometry here, and it, and it does enhance things. Uh, here, I'm not going to go too much into it. I'll just mention it. Music has multiple areas of uh, executive function. First of all, an orchestra has multiple players. In a piano, you have to have actions with your feet and hands. Uh, I can't pronounce. Uh, Dimitri's name here is Tomazzo, I don't know. He wrote something called The Geometry of Music in which he showed that using geometry you can understand chordal progressions. A person named Toussaint wrote a beautiful book. It's a mathematical book. Every popular, popular uh, rhythmic thing like the rumba and all these other things are in the book. They're analyzed rhythmically and he has a beautiful geometric way of doing it. Uh, there is emotional satisfaction here also. I didn't have time to look that much into it. But music therapy is often used in prison reform music therapy. The idea of executive function as creating emotional satisfaction, I think, is important. Uh, OK, I've gone through, as I said, I've gone through music, law, music I just touched. I've gone through literature, math, and I've mentioned calculus and other things. So this is the conclusion. Um, my new definition is cybernetic, and it's interdisciplinary. It's operational. I go to a textbook, I say, how many areas of the brain uh, are you addressing? If you say, well, that's not that important, I'll say it is that important. I think Rene Descartes is the best example. How many parameters? It supplements, not replaces the old definition. If you are teaching verbal problems, continue to do so, but I'm justifying why it works. And <clears throat> it encourages a simple focus. You don't have to memorize long synonym lists. Multiple modalities, multiple parameters for pedagogic challenge. Thank you.